Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and welcome to part 8 of our review slash how-to slash overview for Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. Today we're going to discuss worlds. While some groups might play Traveler only limited to a single planet or a single city, like Blade Runner, or to a single solar system, like the first few seasons of The Expanse, most players are going to be traveling to many exotic and strange worlds. Traveler offers us hundreds of pre-made worlds to use, and I've talked about TravelerMap.com and just how incredible of a site that is. The core book offers us a sample subsector map with details for all the worlds inside it, but it also gives us all the rules and tools for a game master to just grab a blank hex page and begin creating their own custom universe. While I originally considered doing a step-by-step -step showing game masters how to do all the roles in order to create their own universe, I decided that it was more important that we show both players and game masters how to read these maps, because while yes, they might appear simple on the surface, there is an impressive amount of detail that these maps contain, and it's very important that players especially know how to read this information. So for my example, I'm going to use the world of New Home. It's in the Old Island subsector of the Reft, and I'll use it not because it's necessarily a better planet to use than any others, but because our next game is going to be taking us there, and I might as well kill two birds with one stone by also showing my players specifically about the planet that their characters are headed toward. So looking at the map as well as the subsector key, we can see several things here. First is the name. The hex number, which Parsec it appears in, number 1925, we see that it has both a military and naval base. We also see that it has one or more gas giant planets, which will be handy for refueling. But the most useful thing is this eight-digit alphanumeric number. This is what's called the Universal World Profile, or simply UWP for short. Each digit tells us a different aspect about the main world of that system, and because the values can get high, the numbers are alphanumeric to keep them all single digit. They call it hexadecimal, but it isn't exactly hexadecimal because the values can go above F. It is a nitpick point, I know, but essentially we substitute letters for numbers above 9. A for 10, B for 11, etc, etc. Now some Traveler veterans out there can simply read a UWP number and know everything that it means. I can't, however, so I always have to look it up. Now thankfully there is a fan-made cheat sheet out there that I found and that I use. You can get this on DriveThru RPG. it's part of a Game Master screen pack, and it's set at pay what you want, and I use the hell out of this thing, and I've given copies to all my players to use in their player folders. I highly recommend it because it has been a lifesaver for me. Uh, that way we don't have to slow down everything in-game in order to pull out the books and check what everything means. It's right there at everyone's fingertips, so I stuck a link below for it. So let me walk you through how to read this profile number using New Home as my example. The first digit is for starport quality. This is the main starport because there might be several ports on or around the planet. They can range from spectacular with full repair facilities to a crappy frontier port that's little more than a shack beside a dirt pad. New Home is an A, which means they have the best facilities, capable of repairing any size ship, and has refined fuel available. We'll expand more on star points a little bit later on in this video, but for the time being, the first digit in the UWP tells you what level of starport you'll find. Next is planet size, in our case 5. Planet size determines the level of gravity to expect. It ranges from zero gravity, meaning that it's an asteroid belt or a planetless system, maybe with some you know, city-sized space station inside of it, up to a giant planet with 1.4 g that requires special suits just to get around, or might require some time to acclimate to. New Home is a 5, meaning that it's small with 0.45 gravity. The book explains that it requires either the deck's athletic skill or 1d6 weeks to fully acclimate to this without suffering any ill effects. Which means that if your group is going to either a high gravity or a low gravity world, because you're going to be spending a full week in jump space just to get there, go ahead and adjust your ship's gravity on that voyage, either up or down, to be the gravity that you expect to encounter. That way by the time you arrive, you're at least partially if not fully acclimated. Next is atmosphere type, in our case 6. Atmospheres can range from no atmosphere vacuum, like the moon, to high pressure atmospheres or even toxic or corrosive ones. Some might require a suit or respirator to breathe, while others might be tainted and require a filter mask to keep from inhaling something bad. 
Now, with tainted atmospheres, that can mean a lot of things. Maybe it's dust or smoke or other particulates in the air that could irritate your lungs. But maybe it's alien spores. Maybe people get used to this after a while and the locals ain't got to wear a mask no more because they're all used to it. Or maybe it's something that's got an inoculation shot available at the starport and all you got to do is get your shots. So Game Masters, it's up to you to decide what exactly that tainted atmosphere means and if it's something that can be overcome. But players, when you arrive at a planet that's got a tainted atmosphere, until you either get used to it or get your inoculation shot, keep your damn mask on. New Home is a 6, meaning that it has an ideal Earth-like atmosphere, which is great. Next is Hydrographics, in our case 5. This number tells us how much water is on the planet, ranging from a completely dry desert planet like Arrakis to a flooded water world with no land masses at all. At 5, New Home is about 50% water, a little less than Earth, but it does contain some oceans. Next is Population. How many people live here? It can range from a single family or an outpost to a massively packed planet populated in the trillions. New Home is an 8, meaning the planet's population is measured in the hundreds of millions but hasn't quite reached a billion yet. Next is Government. How is this planet run and who runs it? It might be total anarchy to a religious dictatorship. It might be balkanized, meaning that the planet has no central government but is instead broken into many separate warring or rival nations. Each type of government has different things that they might try to suppress or control, such as technology or information that either offends their sensibilities or threatens their power by letting the people know too much. New Home is a five, which is a feudal technocracy, meaning they hold technology in the highest of regards, and those in power have the best and most cutting-edge technology. Imagine a world ruled by Elon Musk as Steve Jobs. Not where they just have power, money, and influence, but where they're actually calling all the shots there. And that guy that you call for tech support on your computer? Yeah, that guy is given the same respect everywhere that they'd give to a doctor or lawyer. Next is Law Level, and this is one of the first things that many players need to consider when they're visiting a new world. Law Level shows how weapons and armor are treated here and what travelers can get away with carrying. It might be completely lawless where everything goes, or instead of laws they have, you know, social etiquettes or traditions or stuff that people follow even though there's not actually a formal law against stuff. Or it can range to a strict zero weapons or zero armor available to civilians or anybody that doesn't have a special license to carry them. This not only means that getting caught with one of these banned weapons or banned armor on the planet, you might face some stiff penalties, but it also means that finding these banned weapons on this planet if you're looking to purchase or use them for yourself is going to be a lot harder to do because their availability is so much narrower, and it really depends on how far from the law level that particular item is banned. But it also means that if you're looking to sell some of these outlawed weapons on this planet, you're probably going to get a better price for them. New Home is a 7, which means shotguns and everything above it are banned. However, bladed weapons and stunners and light armor is fine for a traveler to carry, though it might still get them some unwanted attention by the authorities. We'll explain law level a little bit later in this video, but for the time being, this is just where you find it. The final number is the planet's tech level. This shows what type of technology is produced and is available here. D translates to a 13. We can see that at tech level 13, gravity vehicles like flying cars are common, and we have true artificial intelligence, and we've had that for some time, as well as cloning and jump 4. Vehicles and equipment that's at tech level 13 should be available on this planet, providing they're legal, of course. Higher tech equipment can likely be found here as well, but is rare, meaning that it has to be imported from another planet, and it's probably going to be a little bit more expensive because of that. Which means that if your character really wants some sweet power armor, but they're on a tech level 10 world, they might be able to find some of the TL10 armor, but finding the tech 12 armor is going to be a lot harder here, and if they find it, it's going to cost a little bit more than that list price. And if by some miracle they find some tech level 14 armor, which is 4 levels higher than the planet they're on, it's going to cost way more than the listed price. Which leaves your characters with the issue. Should you buy this tech level 14 armor here and pay an arm and a leg for it? Or should you maybe save your money and wait till you get to a tech level 14 planet or maybe even a tech level 13 planet and get that armor a whole lot cheaper? 
Game Masters should always consider the planet's tech level and law level whenever they're using the world. Not just for considering what's available for players to purchase or find while they're there, but all aspects about the world should be taken into account. You know, how are the bad guys here going to be armed? It wouldn't make much sense for that random gang of street thugs to be, you know, inappropriately sporting a bunch of high-tech weaponry that's far above the tech level of the planet they're on. Unless, of course, the plot to the adventure is to find out who is arming these thugs with all this high-tech weaponry that has to be coming from another planet. There needs to be a reason why that security system or computer encryption is at a tech level 12, but the planet itself is just a measly tech level 8, or vice versa. If it's a high-tech world, why do they have this janky old tech level 8 security system here? The Game Master should have a reason as to why any obstacles or loot that is found here should be of a different tech level than what's normally available on this planet. And that will help the Game Masters design worlds that feel different from one another than just simply being, it's a different world and you just kind of say that it's a tech level or a law level different than the last one. Everything about this world should reflect these two numbers. Now one thing that the UWP tells us, but isn't separately listed on the hex map, is trade codes. You can see New Home has a trade code of RI, which means rich. Trade codes are determined if certain criteria are met in the UWP, such as New Home being rich because it meets all of these requirements. But also, New Hope being tech level 13 should give it a high tech code listed because it meets the standards of being a tech level 12 or higher, so it looks like they did a bit of an error by not listing that code beside the planet. These codes are useful for trade, especially for speculative trading, and we're going to explore all of that information in a later video, but I wanted to show where all the trade codes come from and that they're just a shorthand that a certain combination of UWP data has been met. Okay, that is it for the UWP code. But but you can see that it has a lot of information to give, providing that you and your players know how to read it. Travelers should have access to that code as well as some basic planetary information that's available to them in their ship's computers. And again, I highly recommend that Game Masters pass out sheet sheets like the ones that I linked to, that way players can quickly navigate that in-game. However, there are a few other details that the code does not give you that Game Masters, especially ones that are building their own world, should take into consideration such as temperature. It could be a frozen world like Hoth, or so hot that liquid water only exists at the poles and the only habitable zones are on either end of the planet. There's also culture. Game masters should come up with the local culture differences that travelers might encounter here, and there's a handy chart to help you out. These can be major things, but you can also do little things like fashion, like everyone here wears this elaborate makeup or some elaborate or strange hairstyle, or maybe they just wear space capes. Some Something about it that stands out, that way when the player characters walk out onto this planet for the first time, you can tell the players something about this world that makes it unique and just the way the people carry themselves or the way the architecture is, or just something unique about it, that way it looks different. Next let's look at travel zones. Some planets might be noted as being either amber or red zones. For example, this planet is an amber zone, you can see it outlined in yellow. Amber zones should be considered travel advisories against going there. The planet might be in some sort of political upheaval at the moment, or maybe they're just really unwelcoming to outsiders there. There's no law that says that travelers cannot go to an amber zone, but advisories warn that maybe they should be a little ready for trouble if they do decide to go. There also might be some difficulty that they encounter if they're trying to get you know, passengers or cargo with them when they go there, uh, just because people might not want to be shipping or going there due to political unrest, embargoes, or other things like that. Red zones are different. Red zones are completely forbidden to visit. Why? Well, maybe there's some primitive species down there and the other planets in the area have decided to turn this area into a preserve and protect this species from some sort of outside influence. Maybe there's some sort of horrible disease down on the planet, you know, alien spores, and no one wants to risk that somebody could go down to this planet, get infected, and then travel around the rest of chartered space, infecting billions or trillions of people. Whatever the reason, the planet has been blockaded, and now there's patrol ships or mines, and anyone coming in or going out without special government permission is going to be fired upon. Red zones should be avoided. Avoided? Whenever I see a red zone, I think adventure. There is something down on that planet that we're going to have to retrieve. And all those blockades and mines, that's just nothing more than a sweet obstacle that we're going to overcome.
The final thing you can see on the star map is X-boat routes. You can see them on this one from the Spinward Marches, the Little Green Paths here. X-boats are super fast, usually jump six ships that carry news and information across chartered space. An information delay between the different systems really depends on how far a system is from the nearest X-boat stop. Consider these paths your main trade routes. Your best ports are going to be along them, as well as your best opportunity for adventure and profit. But if you're trying to stay off the grid for some reason, like maybe you stopped making payments on your ship and now you got repo men after you, or because you broke the law level on some planet somewhere and shot the place up with your plasma rifle, yeah, in that case, you probably want to avoid those trade routes. Now let's look at starports. We already saw that starports can be of different ratings, such as A, B, or C, and that there may be multiple ports on or above the planet. But now let's go ahead and talk about them in a little bit more detail. There are two types of starports. Downports, which are planet side with large landing pads and buildings. Think of your most Eisley port from Star Wars. Then you have high ports. These are orbital space stations, possibly city size, that ships can dock with. Some worlds may only have one type of port, uh, while many, especially class A or Bs, they may have both a high port and a down port. Huge ships, like thousand tons or more, or non-streamlined ships that might not be able to safely go through the atmosphere and land on the surface, so they dock with a high port and then they travel down to the down port through shuttlecraft or a space elevator. Outside the downport is often a city, referred to as a star town, usually brimming with potential passengers, you know, traders looking to move cargo, and countless businesses and criminals eager to separate off-worlders from their hard-earned credits. Many starports have a different law level than the world that the starport is on. Usually it's going to be of a lower law level than the world that it's on. You know, so travelers who never leave the starport onto a very strict law level world might still be allowed to carry their sidearms around as long as they stay within the starport. This might be to comply with some sort of you know, interstellar law that all starports are at a law level 5 or a law level 6, or maybe the ruling government of a particular planet that's got very strict laws went ahead and made the starport laws a little bit more lax as a way to maybe encourage visitors to come and check it out. Maybe then they'll put away their weapons and go out onto the planet. However, at some point, either when the player characters are entering the starport or they're leaving the starport to go out on the world, travelers are going to have to go through security and any illegal weapons, armor, or contraband might be discovered. Security might consist of pat-downs, low-tech metal detectors, or high-tech scanners, and travelers might need to use stealth or bribery to get those weapons through. The penalty for being caught really just depends on the law level of the world as well as how banned that particular item is. It might just be a slap on the wrist, confiscation of the item, monetary fines, or even prison. A lot of players see these security checks as ways that mean and controlling game masters could try to stop them from getting all of their sweet, sweet weapons down onto the planet. But that's not the case at all. Security checks should be looked at no differently than any other obstacle in a tabletop role-playing game. And players who are both clever and daring enough to roll those dice are the ones that get to reap those rewards. Players might try to hide their weapons on their person, or maybe inside some of the different cargo as a way of getting bonuses, you know, carefully storing them in hidden compartments or breaking them apart to appear like parts on some sort of machinery or something like that, kind of like the crew did in Alien Resurrection. Some weapons are designed to sneak past security points. Even scan jammers might be added to non-stealth weapons in order to give them a plus. The Traveler's Companion gives us several good modifiers to help with security scanners. Just remember that if you do manage to get your laser gun or other weapon through security and down onto the planet, depending on that stop point, you might have to go through security again just to get back through and back to your ship. So depending on the situation, it's not a bad idea just to go ahead and ditch your weapon planet side or maybe sell it to somebody who would be interested in having a very fine and highly illegal weapon than it would be to try to sneak it back through again. It'd be a real shame to get busted before you could even make your escape. For smuggling other goods, such as computers onto a planet where they might be banned, or trying to get drugs or some contraband on a world, 
The Journal of the Traveler's Aid Society, Volume 1, offers us information like using fake cargo modules to slip things through inspections. The last thing I want to talk about is exceptions to the UWP. I already mentioned that starports might have a different law level than the planet that the starport's on, but Game Masters might require a little bit more than that. Tech level, for example, might only represent the major cities of a planet, and then the further you get out from those major cities, the tech level might drop by one or even two, just depending on how far away they are. One area that I've written exceptions myself has to deal with world government. I don't think it's that far-fetched that the recognized planetary government might not quite control 100% of that particular planet. Maybe they control 99% or 95% with these kind of small, independent countries you know scatter around inside and these countries might be weak they might be of a lower tech level they might be of a higher or lower law level just depending and but one recent game that i did involved the travelers going to a tech level 9 world that had a planetary government but I wanted to run an adventure that required, you know, two smaller governments that were tech level six. So I made an island on this planet that the characters went to, and it was small, about the size of Jamaica, and it was split right down the middle with these two different countries, and each of those countries had about a quarter million people. So, you know, the travelers went there, we had our adventure, and it was a tiny little exception to the planet's UWP to its normal government and tech level. Another one that I did was in the Sindal subsector, the planet Thebus, is a low population, law level zero world. The description says that it's a popular spot for the wealthy to hunt these giant mutant lions there. So I added a resort hunting lodge that the travelers encountered where these ultra-rich clients would come in, uh, they would enjoy the spa and the pool, maybe play a few rounds of golf, and then they would go out with these guides that were employed by this lodge to go out and hunt these giant lions or other games. So while the planet itself was listed at being a law level zero, inside this luxury resort, law level was a stricter five or six where weapons had to be locked up while anybody was inside this particular resort. So Game Master always remember that the UWP is trying to describe an entire planet or an entire system that might have multiple planets inside of it, and it doesn't mean that you can't drop in exceptions to that. You know, if you have some sort of adventure idea that you want to use, but doesn't quite match what the UWP says. In fact, many of those exceptions are where you're going to find some of your best adventures. Okay, that is it for this episode. There's, of course, a lot more we could go into, especially a lot of little details about starports, but I think this works as a really good foundation for players and game masters to start building on as far as, you know, what to expect, as well as how to understand worlds, and most importantly, how to understand the UWP and everything that it has. Of course, if you do want more, the Core Book and the Traveler Companion are great resources. The Essential Supply Catalog goes over equipment availability in black markets. And the Journal of the Traveler's Aid Society, Volume 3, goes over starport traffic. Uh, volume 5 goes over government law enforcement and security forces. For the next episode in this series, I hope to go over cargo, passengers, and trade. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews, how-tos, or any more of this Traveler series, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, Travelers, you have a great day. You know, after that incident that happened in the mystery of BTSHT365, I added a new portion to the UWP. I call it the Soda Code, and it tells me what the preferred soft drink is on any given world. So you better believe that I am never going back to another Pepsi system again.